Hello, today we're going to cover collision detection between circles and axis lined bounding boxes. This should be a relatively short and simple video, but it's super important for understanding the next couple of videos which are going to talk about some of the collision detection optimization algorithms that we can use. What I'm not going to be talking about is a generic algorithm to do any collision detection. We're going to be talking about that in later videos, and a lot of that is going to be based on what we talk about here. But this video is talking about a specific type of collision detection for a couple specific types of objects. First up, consider the collision between two circles. If you don't know how this is done, I encourage you to pause the video and try to work this out on your own. It's a good exercise. So what information do we have available about these circles? We're probably going to have the radii and we probably have their positions. Now intuitively, if you were to add those two radii up, then that would give you the maximum distance between those two circles where they are still touching. So if the, dis if the circles were any closer together than the sum of their two radii, then they must be colliding and otherwise they're not. So the first step is to calculate the distance between the circles. And that can be done using this formula. Oh, and I should just clarify, this is the distance between the centers of the circles which I'm assuming that when you have the position of a circle, that position is the position of the center of the circle. And everyone's seen this before, it's just the Pythagorean theorem. And writing this out as a conditional statement, you have r1 plus r2 is greater than the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And if that condition is true, the circles must be colliding. And if it's not true, the circles are not colliding. But it turns out that doing a square root is computationally expensive, and so you want to cut that out if possible, and uh, there's an easy way for us to do that. All you have to do is square both sides of this inequality, and you've gotten rid of the square root. And, uh, you know, squaring something is a lot more efficient than doing a square root. And that's important because you might be doing thousands of these per second. And when I say square, I don't mean use your math library's exponent function, just multiply the two terms together or use a temporary variable and multiply it by itself. And uh, that's more efficient because you don't know what's going on inside that, that uh, math library. Next up are collisions between axis aligned bounding boxes. And just to reiterate what I said in the first video, an axis aligned bounding box is a rectangular shape which is not rotated with respect to the axis. So in other words, the sides of the boxes are aligned with the axis and the, uh, the boxes are oriented um, similarly with respect to each other. And if you haven't seen this before, uh, it might seem a little intimidating if you were to ask how to find out if two boxes are colliding, uh, because it seems like there's a lot of different configurations. Like they might be colliding like this, or they might be colliding like this, or they might be colliding like this, they might be inside of each other. So obviously there's a lot of different checks you have to do, right? Well, it turns out it's actually pretty straightforward. As always, if you haven't seen it before, I would encourage you to pause the video and try to work this out on your own because it's not overly complex and it's a good exercise. When you're solving this, you can assume that you know the coordinates of each of the vertices in each of the rectangles. And if you don't know that, but you know the width and the height and you know the position of the center of the rectangles, then you can calculate the positions of the vertices. In order to solve this, let's drop the y-axis and find out if the two shapes are colliding in the x-axis, since that's a simpler problem. And um, so we'll drop the, the y-axis, and those dotted lines don't represent the distance from the axis. They represent a projection onto the x-axis of those vertices. And we'll give these boxes some labels. So we'll, we'll designate the magenta box as box 1 and the teal box as box 2. And then our uh, points along the x-axis are L1, R1 for the magenta box, and, and L2, R2 for the teal box. And if you do that, there's a really simple formula that you can use to determine whether these boxes are overlapping on the x-axis. These boxes are colliding if L2 is less than R1 and L1 is less than R2. So pause the video and let that sink in. So this works no matter where these boxes are, like, you know, the boxes could be positioned like this, or they could be overlapping, and those con that condition is still true, or they could be colliding on the other side, and the condition is still true. But if you go a little further, now L1 has become greater than R2, and so the boxes are no longer colliding. And if we move the teal box to the other side, now L2 has become greater than R1, and again, the boxes are no longer colliding. 
So we can repeat this for both axes, and the boxes are colliding if they are colliding in the x-axis and they are colliding in the y-axis. And here's the conditional formula that you can use, assuming that t1 and t2 are the respective top points of the boxes and b1 and b2 are the respective bottom points. And one thing I should say about this is that this makes the assumption that the up direction is positive. And uh, in fact, in a lot of uh, environments that you'll be programming in, the up direction is actually negative. And uh, I think there's a whole history behind why that's the case. But just make sure that if you implement this, that you pay attention to the coordinate system that your environment is using. Now you might be wondering about some of the other nice collisions that are possible and whether we're going to be covering them in this video. And the short answer is no. And the long answer is that all of these collisions uh, will be covered in later videos. Um, they require some um, knowledge in uh, some different algorithms. Um, actually, you know, collision detection between these polygons is not really a, a trivial thing. So there's some more advanced algorithms. But the reason I'm talking about the collisions between circles and axis line bounding boxes is because the formulae are very simple and so you can use them actually in a lot of different games where you don't need to have precise collision detection but there's another use to these bounding boxes which is that let's say that you had some complex polygons um, really what you would have to do in order to test whether these shapes are colliding you would have to break them up into triangles and then do collision detections between all of the different triangles between the two shapes and that very quickly uses a lot of CPU time and if you had hundreds of these shapes all on the screen at the same time then you're wasting a lot of processing power and it could result in choppy game physics or it could slow down your game. So what you do is just wrap a box around these polygons and, uh, and all of a sudden you have a very efficient test that you can use to determine if these shapes might be colliding and then if they might be colliding based on their bounding boxes, then that might warrant using a more sophisticated and robust collision detection test. And in this case, you can see that the shapes are not colliding, but the axis aligned bounding boxes are determining that there may be a collision. Um, so if you know something about the shapes, you know, these are um, pentagrams, which are you know, approximately, uh, they follow kind of a circular pattern. So if you knew that, you could just use circular bounding boxes instead of axis aligned bounding boxes. A circular bounding box test determines that these are definitely not colliding. So you can optimize your code if you have additional information about the shapes that might be present in your simulation. And that's, again, one of the perks to building your own physics engine instead of using someone else's physics engine because they don't know what you're building and they don't know what optimizations might be useful for your specific situation. In fact, in a lot of situations, I'm sure you can just use a circular bounding box to represent your pentagram and not do a more advanced collision detection and just assume that they are, you know, they're roughly a, a circle. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, most people won't even uh, care, depending on what you're building. I mean, that, it's probably good enough if you just treat them like circles. And the last thing I'll say about using axis line bounding boxes is that you can use them to group shapes together and then having the boxes surround those groups of shapes and then you can rule out entire branches of collisions and save yourself tons of processing time. And that's going to be a topic for the next video when we talk about dynamic axis aligned bounding box trees. And uh, so I'll leave it at that for now. So thanks for watching video three in this series. There's a playlist in the video description if you haven't seen the other two videos. I'm sorry for the relatively long video. I thought I would get this done a lot sooner because um, I know this is review for a lot of people. In any case, stay tuned. In the next video, we're going to be doing dynamic uh, access line bounding box trees. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.